in West Michigan. 1958. <laughs> okay. And I can personally thank him because in 1999, he repaired this thumb for me. <laughs> Three pins saved my career. So you don't want to hear me speak. You want to hear him speak without any further interruptions by me. Please welcome Dr. John Hopp. Thanks, John. Um, no, sure. Forgive me if my voice is a little rough and hope it doesn't fail me, but it was completely gone two days ago. I've been recovering from a cold, so I wasn't sure I was going to actually be able to do this today. So it's worked out. My COVID test was negative twice. <laughs> Yeah, that's the problem. Oh, trying to get rid of that? Yeah. Sorry. No problem. Okay. I was tasked with giving you guys a talk on the history of total joint replacement, which is fairly broad. And so I, I've decided just to, to start and we'll go through some slides and some things that I have to, to say, and then leave quite a bit of time, hopefully for some uh, Q and A and questions about things. So, um, and if you do have questions in the, in the midst of the talk, I don't have a problem with you raising your hand. We can address things as we go along. So, so what is joint replacement? Uh, joint replacement, really, we define as replacement of a diseased or degenerated joint. Sorry, it's one of those fear slides. No. Oh, okay. We'll better fix this, then we'll start over. Sorry about that. That's all right. Okay. They haven't really missed much, so we'll go back here. There's always technology things, yeah. yeah. Glad I have people to do it. I'm not the king of technology by any means, so. <laughs> I think we're good to go. So once again, we're going to go through history of total joint replacement uh, today and have lots of times for questions and, and discussion of things that, that you're interested in. So we define joint replacement as re removal of a disease joint, replacing it with prosthetic materials with the aim of restoring the joint function and reduction of pain and improvement in quality of life. So reasons for joint replacement. The primary reason for most joint replacements is a, some sort of disease that leads to degeneration of the joint. And osteoarthritis is the most common reason for that in the joint replacements that we do at this time. It's probably one of the most common diseases. And, and, and when you look at causes of disability in the United States, osteoarthritis is one of the top three. And so it's a very big problem and we hope to intervene with these type of procedures to help improve patient's quality of life. Inflammatory arthritis is another uh, form of arthritis that encompasses about, some people say up to two to 300 different subsets of arthritis. And these are more systemic diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, enteropathic arthritis. And there's a whole bunch of smaller subsets within there. And those are treated for the most part medically uh, with rheumatologists directing that kind of a treatment until they become unfortunately often end stage where they need somebody like me to do a joint replacement. 
Other reasons for people coming to need joint replacement would include trauma, sometimes hip fractures and those kind of things we will, we will perform joint replacements on as the best treatment instead of trying to get the fracture to heal. There are some congenital deformities, things like avascular necrosis, which is a disruption of blood supply to the bone surrounding the joint that causes the joint to break down and develop arthritis. And there are also some metabolic bone diseases such as Paget's disease, which can also affect the joint as well. But the primary most common source is osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is an age-related wear and tear process that, that uh, goes on in the joint. You can see we go from a normal joint with good cartilage to one where the cartilage is worn down, resulting in loss of that joint space, deformities, pain, swelling, stiffness, and all the things that come along with that. And osteoarthritis probably has multiple different reasons that it occurs. There are definitely genetic com components to patients that get osteoarthritis, and we think that relates to genetic differences in collagen, which are one of the main building blocks of cartilage. Injuries can cause damage to the cartilage that sets this process of osteoarthritis off. And then just general wear and tear over time. And for a lot of people, it's a combination of those factors that brings them to the end stage of osteoarthritis. And again, an inflammatory arthritis, such as rheumatoid arthritis, is a little bit different because it involves the lining of the joint. It's an autoimmune-based process and a systemic disease. Patients with rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis often have other manifestations such as skin problems, lung problems, and more systemic issues other than just their joint problems that they come to see somebody like me for. Often inflammatory arthritis, is in, uh, such as rheumatoid arthritis, often cause much more deformities in the joint as well because they can involve ligament damage as well as just the joint damage. So historical replacements. Really the beginning of joint replacement began in the late 1800s and it was a response more to tuberculous infections. And, and that was a big problem at the time where patients would get tuberculous infections that would destroy the joint and they wanted to have some sort of way to replace the joint and restore function. And a lot of this was pioneered in the hip joint and materials such as wood and ivory were used to make a ball for the top of the, and they tried to attach it and it didn't work out terribly well, but those were the initial attempts at joint replacement. Then there, there were also attempts for arthritis such as post-traumatic arthritis and osteoarthritis and post-tuberculous arthritis to resurface the joint, put something in between so you don't have these bad surfaces rubbing against each other. And things like pig bladders were used, gold foil, uh, and those really had poor results as one would expect. And then along comes in the 20s, a doctor called Dr. Smith-Peterson in England who started to develop a different type of resurfacing for the hip. And he started with glass and Pyrex with a mold that would go over the ball and interpose between the ball and the socket. And that had some, some success, but was fragile. Obviously glass is not very, very uh, durable and could break. So they moved on to other materials such as Bakelite and then on to metal alloys. And if you look here, these are a few examples. Here's some of the Bakelite and uh, acrylic um, models that they then progressed on to metal alternatives to cap the, the ball and provide some sort of interposition between the ball and the socket. And those actually had some, some decent success. Um, I actually had a few patients when I was training in Iowa that had had cup arthroplasties that were done about 50 years prior that were still functioning. They were, they were getting along. They weren't as successful and functional as our modern hip replacements, but they actually worked. And then came along the concept of, well, one of the problems when you're just interposing something in the joint, you're really not dealing with the problem of the, the joint surfaces and cartilage being completely destroyed and gone. And it wouldn't completely relieve pain, it just helped. So the idea of trying to replace those joint surfaces came along with a French surgeon named Dr. Jude, who decided he was going to replace the head of the, of the arthritic femur with, with different materials. And acrylic was his main material that then moved on 
to metal materials later. And the results of these were better as far as pain relief, but were very, very short in duration and durability because they had poor ways to fix the implants to bone. And that became the problem. Here's an early Judea prosthesis. If you see, this is an acrylic ball with an acrylic stem that they would remove the ball, drill a hole in the femur and put the stem down in there, but they didn't have a way otherwise than fitting it in tightly to fix it to the bone. So often the long-term durability was not very good. And also the problem there was you're just treating one side of the joint. You're getting rid of the arthritis on the, on the ball side, but the socket still had no cartilage and that could be a, still a source of pain. So then things moved on to what was con considered total resurfacing where you remove the ball and put a new surface in the socket. And that started in the 60s and 70s. Actually, one of the pioneers was Dr. Townley, who was over in Port Huron. He was a pioneer in that, in that arena of hip resurfacing, and he developed a few implants that were actually quite successful, um, other than materials issues with the plastics that he chose weren't, weren't very durable, but had some very good ideas. And these were kind of the resurfacing concepts at that time where a plastic socket was implanted into the, into the socket and then a mold to go over the, the ball. And those had some success, but not enough to, to really give a durable result. And so the next development was developed in the 1960s, which was the, the onset of what we would consider total joint replacement and total hip replacement where you're removing the ball and putting a whole new socket with a ball attached to a stem that is able to be fixed into the bone much, much better and have a more long standing um, fixation and durability. And the key that was, that was figured out at that point was fixing the, bone, the, the stem to the bone using polymethyl methacrylate bone cement. That kind of was a world changing uh, advance in, in joint replacement at the time. And the, the pioneer of this was Dr. John Charnley, who was a surgeon in Oswestry, England. And he's really considered the father of modern joint replacement. Very, very smart man. And, and he came up with the idea of doing resurfacing both sides and fixing the parts with the bone cement to give a durable result. And he also had a lot of good concepts on how head size and, and socket size inter, interrelated because then once fixation became a, an accomplishment that we could do with the cement, the next thing that became a problem was these parts wear over time. How do you avoid that wear? And he was always very interested in that. His first prosthesis that, that he made was a Teflon socket. And it, it gave great low friction and, and seemed to work well, but failed very quickly because Teflon wears very quickly and also incites a very bad inflammatory response. And so these patients would do very well initially, but then the Teflon would wear and then wind up with a very swollen hip that looked like it was infected and it would resort bone around it. And it was very a failure at that point, but then he realized that he needed a new material. Because the Teflon was such a bad experience, he actually implanted different materials into his own thigh to see how his body would react to it because he wasn't gonna subject his own patients to the same experience until he knew something that he was gonna use was inert and could be, could be uh, tolerated by the body. So pretty, pretty dedicated if you start doing that to yourself, right? He finally settled on high density polyethylene, which was the next big leap in, in improving joint replacement. So high density polyethylene socket that the body can accept very well and had really decent wear characteristics where the joint comes together. So we have a lot to owe to Dr. John Charlie and there's a lot of surgeons throughout joint replacement history that have made advances, but he's probably the key to starting it all off at least. So again, once we got the fixation to the bone fixed, figured out, where of the, the bearing surfaces became the next issue. Um, polyethylene has been a very good bearing surface, but it does wear. And we are 
when we got into the 70s and 80s, we started to, to realize that one of the problems is that the microscopic particles that are shed every time that joint moves and every time that joint wears are on the nano nanoparticle size, they incite the body to respond in an inflammatory fashion that resorbs bone around the implants and eventually causes these bone implant interfaces to break down and the parts to loosen from the bone. So more recently, there's been some, some attempts at trying to say, well, what's the next bearing surface that would be, very, would be helpful? Metal on metal was tried. Um, and there are some successful metal on metal replacements historically, but one of the problems that we realized, and these became a very big um, push in the 1990s to use metal on metal because they're going to be a forever hip joint and, and would, would last the patient their entire life. The problem is metal wears as well. And there's a subset of patients that these metal ions that shed off from the, the joint as it's, as it's wearing again, cause tissue reaction and sometimes catastrophic failures in which bone and soft tissues are resorbed and lost. So we've kind of gotten away from metal on metal. Um, I thought I had a slide there. We've still come back to the polyethylene. Ceramic on ceramic has been used, but one of the problems with ceramic, it's very, very brittle, can chip, can crack, can break. And so that hasn't been a very good, a very good uh, advancement either, although it's still used a lot in Europe. In the United States, really the bearing surface that we've settled on is high density polyethylene and efforts have been made on how to improve that. Um, one of the things that's been done to improve the polyethylene more recently is treating it with heat and annealing the polyethylene to cross link the polyethylene molecules together. So there's less wear. And we actually are getting much better survivorship and less wear with the newest, latest implants because of that. So wear is still currently the biggest challenge as far as we, we know how to fix these parts to the bone now. We have good cement techniques. We also have good techniques now where we can actually put these parts in without cement into the bone that the bone then grows into these parts into porous metal surfaces. And so the fixation part isn't the problem, it's the, still the wear. And that's where a lot of the, the current uh, technologies are being advanced. And we're doing much better with the new, newest technologies and plastic design. So we kind of concentrated initially here on hip replacement, knee replacement at the same time was going through fits and starts and the 1970s and, and before, before that, and the, even the 1800s to the 50s and 60s, as I put here, people were trying to do the same things. They were trying to use pig bladders and they were trying to use things to cover the joints and sometimes stealing tissue from the IT band and putting it over the joint surfaces. And all of those were really not successful. So the knee replacement developers were going through the same fits and starts as the hip replacement guys. And eventually they came into the idea that, that they, they needed to replace these surfaces like the hip replacement guys were. So the issue with that becomes though, the, hip, the knee joint's a much more complex joint. The hip is a ball and socket joint and the mechanics of a ball and socket joint are pretty simple. The knee joint is a much, it's, and it's not just a simple hinge. Everybody thinks of the knee being a hinge. It's not a hinge. It has multiple degrees of freedom and, and the kinematics of a knee joint are, are much more complex. And that's been one of the big things of figuring out how to figure out, replace that knee joint. So it has the same properties and kinematics and feel that a normal knee does. Initially, the replacements that were started to kind of be a total knee replacement were hinge replacements because everybody thought, oh, it's just a hinge joint. All we have to do is link those parts together with a hinge and it's going to be just fine. And Waldius was one of the early ones. He was a German surgeon and he developed this knee replacement that had stems that would go up into the femur and down into the tibia and a bolt that went through the middle and the thing just flexed like a hinge which was good for straightening and bending, but there's no rotation. There's none of the lateral movement, any of the things that your normal knee joint does. 
very functional if you want to just walk in a straight line and have your knee straighten and bend. And it was a big improvement for a lot of patients over their very arthritic knee. But the problem there too is if there's a static hinge here, it transfers all the stress of the torques and things that you're trying to do on your knee from here to the stems where it's fixed to the bone. And so they wouldn't last very long because the, they would torque loose eventually. <clears throat> Then came the advent of condylar knees, which are kind of the basis for all of the subsequent knee designs, including the ones we use today. And the idea with that is we're replacing the surface on the end of the thigh bone, of the femur, surface on the tibia, top of the shin bone, and they are not linked, but they have a plastic part that sits in between, and that becomes the replacement for the cartilage. So this was the basic design that started in the 70s primarily and advanced through, uh, through until now. Again, the biggest concern was getting, how do you get stability in these knees, but also allow the freedom of movement in all the different planes that, that it's needed. And that's been the big development over time. How do we replace some of the, the, the ligament function with these knees? The knee you see here, is what's called a posterior stabilized knee where there is a, we, the posterior cruciate ligament which controls the backwards motion of the tibia is removed, but this cam and post mechanism that you see that polyethylene going up here stops the backward motion. And so there are different designs that substitute for whether or not the surgeon wants to remove that ligament. And then we, use the, we usually leave the ligaments on the side of the knee in place to do their job. And then the surface congruity gives the rest of the stability to the knee. So the condylar knees were able to more accurately restore the kinematics and function of the knee, which, which have been a big improvement over the original hinge designs. And again, this has been the basis for all knee replacements that are out there now. I got these a little bit of order. We'll go back to the wear problem. So even in the knee, now that we've figured out how do you get a stable knee that's got good, good congruity and good surfaces, the, we got that figured out and how we fix the parts to bone, but where that plastic still becomes a problem because it's still a bearing surface issue. And if you look at the x-ray of this hip here, we can see that here's the ball, the socket here, the space is where the plastic is. And typically this hip's probably about 15 to 20 years old there's a larger space between the margin of the ball here and the socket here and hardly any here because all the plastic up here is worn and that ball's going upwards. So we know that certain plastics have higher levels of wear. We look at the ceramic on ceramic, there's very little wear, but it can break and chip and squeak. And so those are, those are not the greatest things to have in your hip either. So we're settling out into the best combination and the metal on metal we talked about, very little wear, but high reactivity to the wear products that cause failure of the hip. So most of our hips we're doing now are we're settling on a ceramic ball, plastic socket. That ceramic is even high, more highly polished than a metal ball. So hopefully there's less wear with that plastic interface with ceramic versus even a highly polished metal ball. And so, excuse me. Didn't turn my phone off. It's Walgreens. I think it's Walgreens calling actually. <laughs> um, so, um, in most patients that that are not high, that are high demand or younger, we're definitely doing this combination of ceramic ball, plastic socket. And that gives the best wear characteristics that we have right now. And we're doing this a plastic that is highly cross-linked and that, that decreases the wear. In patients that are say older, very low demand, we may still do a uh, metal ball plastic socket. And that all starts to speak into the other problem that we have in joint placement is cost. And how do we, how do we prudently do these operations because the number of joint replacements is going up exponentially. 
uh, over time as the baby boomer generation comes into in, into the age of where they're needing these procedures, we're seeing these the numbers of joint replacements go up significantly. So how do we do that responsibly? And we do make some choices uh, as far as implants as you know, ceramic is much more expensive than a metal ball. So we do make some choices there. If I have an, a 90 year old person that needs a hip replacement, she's probably not gonna get a ceramic ball. She's gonna get a metal ball because it doesn't have to last her 20 years. Um, and it will be less expensive to the system. So um, so not, a, not everything that we uh, decide is all just science-based. Some of it's financially based too, um, which is prudent because we don't want to run out of funds. So Mm -hmm. Out of the whole cost of the procedure, mm -hmm. I don't think that the difference between steel and ceramic can be minimal compared to... It's not. it's not. Well, if you're just looking at implant costs, right? In, and implant costs are quite significant. Uh, when you look at the percentage of a total, say, episode of care for, for a hip or knee replacement, it's probably a third of the cost. And so... Yep. The implants that to do a standard hip or knee replacement is probably five thousand dollars in implants. If you're using and if you're not using anything that's really crazy new technology, that's 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 actually high, more expensive. So yeah, it, it's it's hard to believe, but a metal ball is half the cost or less than a ceramic ball. So all those things add up. So. Um, and try to make those choices in the best interest of the patient first, but also having to look at the system and how, how, how are we spending our dollars. <clears throat> Luckily, we're not in the position currently, at least here um, in Holland, that I have somebody telling me this is what you have to use. You don't have a choice. There are places where that's occurring. So, again, we've talked about the, the metal on metal uh, and alternative bearings. And here's a picture of a ceramic on ceramic. Great concept, but has had lots of problems with especially chipping at the edges of the uh, edges of the socket. If the hip goes through range of motion and the neck of the femur hits against it, it can chip, and then that can cause small particles of plastic or of ceramic to get in between that surface, and then that can cause catastrophic wear and failure over time. So. And a little bit about component fixation. Um, we have two ways essentially of fixing these parts to the bone. One is using that methyl methacrylate glue that I talked about. And the interesting thing is methyl methacrylate is the same material that makes plexiglass windows. So that was interesting to find out. Um, but we, we use that, it's very, it's very stable. It's very uh, good. And this is a cemented implant where you can see the, the implants here. The halo of white around it is cement that's fixing it to the bone. There's some thought that one of the concerns in the long run, when you start to talk about 20 to 30 year experience and survivorship, does this cement tend to break down over time? And the, that has spurred the, uh, the thought of using an implant like this, where it has a roughened metal surface with the surface porosity being very carefully carefully um, constructed to be optimum for mimicking the porosity of bone where bone will then grow into these pores and lock the implant into place. By growing into there and giving us a biologic fixation, which is a living fixation, essentially, it can respond and adapt to stress and things over time, which would hopefully outpace a cement fixation over time. So in the United States, at least, majority of hip replacements are done now with cementless fixation. In knee replacements, that's been more of an issue. We've had little, because of the, the stability of the cementless fixation in a knee is not as, as predictable. Most knee replacements are put in with cement, whereas most hip replacements currently are being put in without cement. Although there, is, there are some newer implants in the knee that are being used um, especially in younger patients with really good bone in the knee to do cementless fixation and they have, they're showing some pretty good promise now. Um, 
but that would be the idea is hopefully we get a longer lasting biologic fixation if we can use this type of an implant. And there's been long history of, of development of what's the best type of implant for cementless fixation, what's the best metal. Do we use beads that are centered onto the surface or the, the other option for most is a titanium plasma spray that <clears throat> sprays the titanium in a, in a pattern that mimics that porosity of bone. Majority of the evolution of cementless implants over time has gone from stainless steel with centered beads to titanium components with this plasma spray because the body really accepts titanium very nicely as a, as a very bone friendly um, option because it tends to ingrow into titanium better than it does into a stainless steel. And the other nice thing is when you look at just material properties is titanium, nobody thinks of bone as being as rigid as metal, but it is pretty rigid. Stainless steel is very rigid. Titanium has flexibility in its normal mechanical properties that is more similar to the flexibility of bone, which is probably better that this big, this big rod we're sticking in your bone acts more like your bone than it being stiffer than your own, which can then put stress at the end of the, 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 the stem if you have a very rigid stainless steel um, implant all that stress can be down at the end here. We see some people occasionally get stress fractures down there because all that stress is concentrated in flexibility further down. So mm -hmm. uh, after the operation without cement, you have to be more careful and let that, that bone. Not as much anymore. Uh, because a lot of the, the implant designs are much improved. It used to be, in, you know, when I started this 30 years ago, if we did cementless implants, we would keep the patients on touch weight bearing and you couldn't, you couldn't weight bear on this for two weeks and then a little bit of weight, slowly building it up. And we are now to the point where vast majority of the designs, you can put full weight on it right away. It's fixed very solidly um, because of the geometry and the design of the implant. So we don't have as much worry about about that. But that's a good question because it, for a long time, and, and the thought was, please you know, don't let them walk on it. They got to have at least, you know, six, eight weeks before they can get that bone to grow in there. And we really don't worry about that as much anymore with the newer, newer designs. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that last question was on if we use cementless implants, is there a restriction in weight bearing? And you know, currently for most people, no, unless you find that boy, I'm not quite as happy with the quality of their bone, maybe I'm gonna go a little slower. And that, that, that does happen sometimes, but majority of the time with, with modern cementless implants, we're able to allow them to weight bear fully right away. So, and then we get into the history of, you know, how do you approach the, the joint? And, and, and that does affect in some ways patients, outcomes and, and, and how they do, <coughs> sometimes more than um, others as far as approaches and sometimes a lot less than is advertised and we can talk about that. But to the, as far as the hip goes, there are two main approaches that, that are done to the hip, although there are some other more novel ones that really don't get used much. These would be in the ones, if you're looking at hip replacement, reading about it, thinking about having one done, you're gonna hear about the posterior approach and the anterior approach. And the posterior approach uses an incision on the side of the hip, and then we come in around the back and access the hip joint from the back. It does involve cutting a few small muscle attachments that get reattached at the end of the surgery. This is probably the most widely used approach to the hip. It's the most universally accepted, and it has a very good, good track record and good results. But the anterior approach, which was an old approach, used mostly for fractures and um, a lot of ch child sur uh, child hip surgery for developmental dysplasia and dislocations of the hip as children, came back in about 10 to 20 years ago in a small subset of surgeons trying to use that approach to, to see if they could use it for hip replacement to improve outcomes in hip replacement. So that approach was kind of tailored to doing hip replacements and it's gaining a lot of 
attention and, and, and attraction um, as far as a kind of a new way to get to the hip. Um, it, it is my preferred approach, but I, I probably in, in the uh, smaller percentage of surgeons nationally, it's only probably about 20 to 25% of patients or of surgeons do the anterior approach as their, as their primary approach. The thought is through the front of the hip, we can move between muscles instead of having to cut some of the muscles in the back of the hip. So hopefully it's less invasive. Um, and once you learn the approach and get it down, it's usually as versatile as the, as the posterior approach. The idea is that hopefully less post-operative pain and faster recovery uh, with the anterior approach because we're not cutting those muscles, we're working between muscles. And I think that's probably true, but unfortunately some people have run with this and said that it's a six month faster recovery and it's, but that's just not true. It's probably in the first, maybe six to eight weeks, it's a bit less painful and more, more kind of fast recovery of your hip joint function and you get past six to eight weeks, it's, uh, it's pretty similar. But unfortunately, there are some out there that still tout this as being the greatest thing since sliced bread. And it's that it's if you have a posterior approach, you're you're you shouldn't be having surgery, which is completely untrue. So most of the time I tell people when they come and talk to me, you know, what, what should I do? Should I have an anterior approach? Should I have a posterior approach? I said, you should just find a surgeon that does what they do well and what they, they're confident in doing. And if they do a good job with either one of those, you're going to have a good surgery. So here you can kind of see the incision for these two. The, front, the anterior approach is more on the front of the hip where the posterior approach is kind of on the side and then we go around the back. So, and then there are surgical approaches to the knee and these are a little less varied. We almost always come to the knee from the front. The old traditional incision was making an incision down the front of the knee coming through the splitting the tendon. This is the quadriceps muscle here. If you, this would be the kneecap here and this would be where the, the kneecap tendon attaches to the tibia. We would split that tendon one third on this side, two thirds on that side, and then get access to the joint down here. There's some variations on this approach which would, instead of cutting the tendon, we kind of split the muscle, kind of jog out here and split the muscle. And that avoids cutting that tendon, which seems to be a pretty nice improvement in decreasing patient's pain and their quadriceps function after surgery. Uh, they tend to recover faster with this kind of a, an approach. And then they're quad sparing where you don't make any cuts in the muscle or the, or the tendon, but often this gets split along here below the muscle to allow access. This is a very difficult approach because it's hard to get all of those tissues out of the way to get access to the joint. So not many people use this. There's some very novel things that are out there. If you're doing reading on knee replacements and hip replacements where people are coming in from the inside part of the knee or the outside part of the knee, there are very small percentage of surgeons that are doing that. Some of them are touting it as being better, although there's no data scientifically to prove that it's a better outcome or approach than the standard approaches that we see here. Although these quad, you know, quad sparing mini split are probably what are used most by, by most surgeons now. Occasionally, if you have a really stiff knee, the only way you can do it is by having a much wider exposure and being able to get to where you need to go and do what you need to do. So this brings in kind of the new technology side of things. And, and there's a lot out there now, and we can talk a lot. I'm sure you have lots of questions probably about this aspect of it. Um, computer assisted and robotic technology is probably the hottest thing in joint replacement right now. Um, using robots to help us get better. And it's, it's a hot topic in all of surgery. It's really affecting general surgery, urology, uh, OB-GYN. Every, every field is now starting to use robots to help in surgery with the idea that they can help us be more precise, more reproducible, especially in joint replacement. One of the key things to getting a good outcome is placing the prosthetic components that we're putting in, in the proper orientation, in the proper place with the proper alignment and soft tissue 
stability. So we're hoping that robotics and computer assisted surgery can help us be better at that. And so, and it does appear that likely this will um, be, the, be the future and that we'll be doing a lot of computer assisted surgery. It's still kind of in its infancy and development. And um, I held off for quite a long time doing robotic assisted surgery because I wasn't happy with the systems until about a year ago. I started, I found a system I really liked and I've been doing it for a year and have been quite happy with it. Sorry, I'll turn it off this thing. Um, and so really most of the robotic systems out there rely on a robot that helps you in some way. That robot recognizes the patient and the knee by optical tracking systems that, that this is a camera head that has optical tracking capability. In the surgery, what we will do is place optical tracking arrays that are screwed into the bones. If it's in the knee, it's one into the femur, one into the tibia. If it's in the hip, one into the pelvis, one into the femur. That allows the, the robot to know where the patient's bones are in space and track that very very accurately. Then there's some sort of preoperative input into the computer and robot that allows them to know what's this patient's anatomy and how does that match up with what we're seeing in surgery. Once we put in the tracking devices that the robot registers, we go through a, a, a process of registering points on the patient's bone anatomy to confirm what we're seeing in surgery with a preoperative assessment of the patient's anatomy. And that either can be x-rays that have special markers that become digitized and computerized that, that get fed into the computer, or it can come from a study such as an MRI or a CAT scan. And all of those can, can define points in this patient's bone anatomy that match up with how we align those points in surgery when we identify all of them. And that, that allows the, the robot to know where this patient is in space. And we can then preoperatively, essentially do this patient's surgery on the computer as we would expect things to be placed in the proper position and then execute that in surgery because the robot will come in. This is the Rosa robot, one I use. The robot has attachments that are the cutting blocks for say, I wanna make the cut on the, on the end of the femur, it comes in, puts it right where it needs to be by all the things we did preoperatively, matching up with the patient's anatomy, make that cut and it moves on and then let's, puts the cutting guides in the places we need to make those cuts appropriately. The other one that's getting a lot of press at this point is called the Mako. You may have heard of the Mako Plasti or Mako robot. Mako is a little different in the fact that it uses a CT scan and a preoperative stuff and all that uh, as the other robot, all the robotic systems do, but Mako relies on the robot to have control over the instruments. You can see here, the saw is completely attached to the robotic arm and it controls where that saw goes. The surgeon just essentially pushes a button and it goes like this. <laughs> Um, which I don't like. <laughs> I, I don't like giving up my ability to, to have control over the operation. I mean, the concept is the same. It's just, are you going to be restricted to this robot allowing you to only go where it wants to go, which isn't always 100% right. Um, and I've noticed that with the system I use. I look at it sometimes like, I know this isn't so what's gone wrong? Do you have a bad input point? You know, data in, data out is always, always something we need to be aware of. And so, <clears throat> so if you're not relying on your own surgical acumen and knowing that this is just isn't right, you could sometimes make the wrong decision, even though the robot's telling you that's what you should do. Um, and so I like the fact that this puts it where it needs to be. I can confirm that's what I like. I do the cuts with my own saw instead of the robot. I'm just pushing the button, the robot kind of does it. So different, different technologies, and they both work. When we're looking at kind of results of these, of, of the robotic technologies, the results as far as, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it a neutral thing? 
are, are very mixed. It's not proven to be any worse than our current technologies at all. There are some hints that it will hopefully be better, um, but I think that's an evolution. And I think as these robots get better and our techniques get better, they will kind of meet the promise of a better joint replacement. And there are a lot of claims out there that doing a robotic knee replacement will, will be a faster recovery and a better recovery, uh, especially faster and less invasive. That's not true. It's the same incision, essentially. It's the same surgery. The, I, the, the concept to me and the promise is if we can be better about being reproducible and putting these things in where they need to be every time. And, and again, like I said, I've looked at robotic ones and said, you know, that's not quite where it should be. And when we changed it, it was better. So this is all improving and, I, and it will get better. And I think in the, in the long run, but it's not where it will be in the future currently. But I do think it's an improvement overall. I mean, the nice thing is we can look at the things that we looked at and with feel and touch and said, is this knee stable? Is it, the, are the ligaments balanced the way I want them to be? Well, I can now look at the computer and it can tell me numbers on that. And then I can, I can correlate that with my feel. So it, it takes a little bit of the art of it and kind of gives you some science that you never had, which is nice and I think helps us get better. Other technologies that are out there that have been in use for a bit and actually um, maybe a little bit before the robotics were what we call personalized um, uh, knee replacements, especially where MRIs and CTs were used to model the patient and model their bones. And then through algorithms, we can do the surgery on the computer and we wind up with these, which are cutting guides that actually are made for each patient's own anatomy. So they fit right on there instead of the typical cutting guides we used in surgery. You put those on the bone, they pin right in place, and then you know where you need to make your cuts. These are being almost universally replaced by robotics now. Um, this was an intervening step between, between um, standard instruments and the robotics. There are a few people that are still using these, but the robotics is actually, I think, much more accurate. And then there's the future. What's going to happen in the future? In the future, guys like me are going to be out of business because they're going to have a biologic solution to, to fixing these problems, which will be better for everybody except for me, probably. But, um, but I'll be retired by then, so I don't need to worry about it. Um, no, the, really, the, the, the holy grail is, is, is having a biologic solution to arthritis. Number one, the best thing would be is if we can stop it from ever happening, or as soon as you see it happening, we're going to stop the arthritis process, reverse it, so you don't get a bad arthritic joint, that would be ideal. But if you get somebody that comes to you with a bad arthritis that, that's just the bone on bone, and we have an object, a, a biologic solution to go and we'll put new cartilage in your knee instead of putting metal and plastic parts in your knee and resurfacing your knee with cartilage we can grow in the lab. And all those things are being worked on. They're, none of them are close to clinical practice or even clinical trials currently, but those will be the answers in the future. And there are things that you probably hear about like stem cell treatments and, and things. Those, once we actually learn how to use stem cells and how to manipulate stem cells well, they may have be an answer. Currently our stem cell treatments for at least for arthritis are very rudimentary. It's just obtaining stem cells that we don't know which ones they are. Or they're not differentiated. We're just squirting them in the knee and saying, hope they help you. And they don't, you know, you'll hear a lot of people say, I can get stem cell treatment and it's great. And all the, all the uh, science out there would say for arthritis, at least stem cell treatment doesn't work, but that's because we don't understand it. We don't know how to make these stem cells. You can't expect just squirting a bunch of cells into the knee to kind of go make cartilage where it needs to be made. We're going to have to be more targeted in how we do that. And whether that's finding matrices that we can put stem cells in to become the new surface and implant them right on the surface where they need to be. And those things are work being worked on. And that will be the answer in the future, but I don't think it's going to be in my practice lifetime. So thank you as far as my slides and jabbering, but we have a lot of stuff we can talk about if you guys have questions. Uh, thank you so much for such a clear explanation of everything. 
And thank you also for my new hips. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> but, <laughs> but my question is, um, is most of the research, is the research being done at the university level? And then how does the medical profession interact with the manufacturers to um, get us all of these wonderful replacement parts? Yeah. First question of where is the research being done? Yes, most of it's being done at the university levels. Uh, some of it's being done in private research institutions. Um, you know, all of that mostly is being done through grant proposals and money coming through the government for NIH grants and that kind of thing. Um, once, you know, you, it, it's the whole process. You come up with an idea, you, you're going to research that, you're going to, can I grow cartilage? Okay, you can grow cartilage, can I implant it in a mouse? And so it, they're, then they're going to, you've got to get to clinical trials and then reproduce clinical trials. So we're way away from a clinical solution like cartilage transplantation for, for the, for joints currently, but things are actually, science is moving at a faster pace than it ever has. So um, hope, that's hopeful that'll come around at some point. Your question as far as relationship with clinical practice and, 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 and manufacturers, um, that's always a sticky question. You know, people, there are lots of people that don't want to have clinical practitioners to have any, any uh, relationship with manufacturers because they think it biases them. Um, you know, we rely on, unfortunately, as far as products and things, those are being developed by private companies. You know, there's no research lab that's coming up with the, the latest hip replacement because it's a profitable industry that's all being done by private industry. So, um, and, and for the most part, you know, it's just like any medical supply medicine, you know, clinician relationship, as long as you're careful and, and I don't find a problem, you know, talking to all the implant manufacturers, what do you have? What, what interests me? What, you know, give me your data, making my own decisions, as long as you can make your own decisions on what you feel is best for your patients. So, but there's, there's a lot of collaboration. If you want to have it out there, you can go and find any information on, for us to look at any implant manufacturer and they'll be happy to pitch their products to you. <laughs> <clears throat> but the one, one thing with joint replacement, I always tell my patients too, is the latest and greatest isn't always the best. Um, because when you look at innovations and in joint replacement, the biggest thing we're looking for is longevity. We want this hip to last. I mean, the goal is your lifetime hip or lifetime knee. We don't, we haven't reached that goal yet, but you want one to at least give you the 15 to 20 years that we know a standard joint replacement should now. Sometimes newer implants come out, they look better in the lab, they don't perform as well in, in short-term or even long-term follow-ups. So <clears throat> the latest thing isn't always the best. So you gotta be careful. Um, For the severe trauma uh, patient, <clears throat> secondary to automobile accident, they had to have a uh, teenage trauma that required a hip replacement, or total knee rather, replacement uh, at um, age 30. Given the 15 to 40 year, 15 to a 20 year um, time frame, uh, do you anticipate two questions? Part A, uh, is the secondary or a second surgical procedure going to be any different for that person than it would be anyone else? Uh, and secondly, if you had a crystal ball it, uh, you said not in your practice lifetime, what would you speculate uh, will be the next big thing yeah. downstream? Can they hear the question if it goes through the, do I need yes, to repeat it can. then? If, yes. That should be okay? Yes, you're good. Okay. Yes, we heard it. We're good. All right. The first question, um, revision surgery essentially is what you're asking me. Is it, is it different? Is it easier? Um, revision surgery is, it's, it's tough to tell you because there's so many different things that can happen. Why do you need a revision? What happens? You know, if you have a hip replacement that just the plastic wears and everything else is okay, the parts are fixed the metal parts are fixed well to bone. Sometimes we can just go and change the plastic. That's very simple. Uh, that's a very easy operation, very easy to recover from. Unfortunately, as that plastic wears, like we talked about, sometimes those metal parts lose their grip to bone and sometimes bone can be resorbed. How much bone is lost? What do you have left to deal with? Are there soft tissue de you know, defects from, from a reaction to that wear as well? So it's really hard to give you an easy answer of, well, revision's this. Well, revision can be a huge different 
path for the, depending on what happens in your specific situation. So um, hopefully if you do need a revision, it'll be a relatively simple, straightforward <laughs> plastic exchange. But most of the time, even with patients that have bone loss and, and, and more challenging things, we can get a very functional result. Um, when you look at your first joint replacement, it's always your best. You know, anytime you have another surgery, there's more scarring, there's more, more stiffness. It's, it's just the, the way things are, multiple operations in one area. But usually we can get a very functional result. Okay. I'm blanking on your second question. Pardon? First of all, for the next technology. The next, tech, the next technology is going to be a biologic solution. I don't know what it is, if it's going to be stem cells or if it's going to be implantable cartilage. But the, the thing that we also need to figure out is if you have somebody that has established arthritis, it's not just the fact the cartilage is lost. It's a whole biologic cascade of things that gets that happens. It, it turns on an enzymatic process of enzymes that come from white blood cells and your body's response. It's, it's, it's somewhat of an immune response. You have to figure out how to shut that response down. So if you put new cartilage in there, it doesn't get attacked the same way you're degenerating cartilage did from the arthritis. So it's not just figuring out how do we make cartilage that we can put in there. We have to know how to turn the arthritis process off too. So there's a lot of things that go into it. As a future uh, patient, um, I've been, uh, I had an injury on my knee and I'm eventually going to have to have it replaced. Steve Urban diagnosed it years ago. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I've been paying attention to different, uh, talking to people who've had different situations, different um, uh, uh, procedures, whatever. I think you covered it, but you talked about before robotics, you mm -hmm. talked about the CT, the scan, the modeling yeah, and so the, forth. The personalized so, knees, yeah. yeah personalized. So somebody had talked to me about having a 3D knee. Mm -hmm. Is that what that is? Maybe not. Oh, okay. okay. There may, may be a different thing. All um, right. So anyhow, this person had a 3D knee and was ecstatic about how great it was and, and the recovery time and, yeah. and so forth. So yeah. can you comment on that? Um, making some presumptions on what are you referring to, I guess. <laughs> that's the hard, that's I, the hard that's thing. That's all I know. <laughs> um, right. Well, I think what you're referring to is the, the, the custom 3D knee is, is uh, a very niche product that is out there that some, pay, some surgeons are doing where actually custom made implants are being done off from um, CT scans and MRIs. Uh, not just the cutting guides, that personalized cutting guide system goes with standard implants. Mm -hmm. I think what you're referring to is the 3D custom implants. Right. Track record has been poor. Ah. If you look at them as a total. So your, your friend may have had good results, but... Um, the he was also it's, a recent patient when I talked to him. Right. So several if, years if ago. It's the, if it's the one I'm thinking of that he's talking about, if you look at the total population of patients that have had them, they're not doing as well as the standard knee replacements overall. Okay. Not Good. that they're doing poorly necessarily. There's a higher revision rate within the first two years, and they're not, they're not having as good outcomes. Okay. Good to know. Yep. Thank you. And that's one of those things I was just saying, you know, be, beware of new technology. Okay, because there are a lot of sexy things out there that come up that may not necessarily be better. And everybody likes the new thing and the new set. You know, everybody asked me too, are you going to do my surgery with a laser? Like, no, <laughs> you know, lasers aren't necessary, but everybody thinks it's the, it's, it's the greatest technology. I mean, lasers are good for kidney stones and certain things. They're not good for what I do. Um, so. Yeah, for the benefit of the class, I'm Bill Bredemeyer and Dr. John has replaced both my hips one interior and one posterior. And I will say that four hours after the surgery of both of them, I was in less pain than when I walked in the door at Holland Hospital. Totally recovered very well. But I will say one funny story about Dr. John. <laughs> uh, as many of you know, I'm a huge Ohio State fan. And he happened Got to you be- Got this year. <laughs> Finally. Yeah. I wish this was about three weeks ago. Um, <laughs> But he is a huge Michigan fan. I think he went to Michigan and we would band her back and forth. So as I was going down for my first hip replacement and the anesthesia gets turned on, Dr. John leans in and said, Bill, I've painted your hip maize and blue. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> no! And you couldn't do anything about it at that point. No, do that. We, we had you. <laughs> you can have a revision. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, 
I have two very different questions. One has mm -hmm. to do with, you mentioned how cost is a factor. What other limitations do you face with your choices? And the other one has to do with exercise that would help to develop or prevent the disappearance of or the erosion of cartilage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The cost, I mean, that's a, that's a broad question too. <laughs> you know, anytime we start talking about I mean, medicine and economics and we, we I mean, I, my, my feeling is we need to be stewards of, of how we practice medicine and, and do it responsibly because it's very easy to pick out the most expensive treatment for everybody, even though it may not be better or the most expensive implant. And, you know, in, in, in joint replacement, we do have a fairly good range of implants that we know this one's probably best for that 50 year old that needs a knee replacement. And this one's better for the 85 year old who goes to the grocery store three days a week, you know, and, and there are some surgeons that look at it that way. And there's some say, I just use the state, I use the hot, most costly high performing implant on everybody. And I don't think that's necessarily prudent or smart. Um, my feeling is we should be trying to be good stewards of all the money that's being spent on this stuff because it's, it's considerable. Uh, the cost to, to Medicare for joint replacement is, is one of the, their highest expenditures uh, as we're getting into the baby boomer generation. Um, and people are just having it done more. They're more confident in it now. And we've got good results. And so um, it's just, it's, I do 12 of these to 14 of these a week. You know, so, and that's just me. And so it really does become, you know, to, in my estimation, and I think a lot of surgeons too, that you, you try to make the best choices, number one, for the patient and what they need. And if there's a choice that's the same, but it's this one costs half the cost, we should do that um, because it's, it's smart. Does Medicare limit you? No. No, well, not directly. <laughs> they, met, they limit us in what they pay. You know, they will give the hospital X amount of dollars for your care. And that's outside of what they pay this anesthesiologist, what they pay me. They're, they pay the hospitals, call it a DRG, a diagnosis related group payment. And everything that costs out of there comes out of that bucket. So if I'm putting in a $10,000 implant instead of a $2,000, $3,000 implant, that's a big chunk of that bucket because it's probably $24,000 that Medicare is paying them. So that they don't directly tell us what we can do, but, and they're paying less every year. Mm -hmm. A lot yeah. of uh, original implants had cobalt chrome. Somebody recently uh, was questioning uh, whether or not, is, is there a problem with cobalt or have you heard anything about the, uh, uh, any materials used? Yeah. Uh, in the past? Well, like we talked, like I mentioned, Laura, you know, a lot of the hip replacements at least are going into titanium as far as, far as bone. It's just better with bone. Um, a lot of it is, you know, like the chrome cobalt issue, um, there's two things. One is the metal and metal hips. Those were all chrome cobalt um, bearing surfaces because chrome cobalt alloys are much better better tolerant of scratching and, and, and wear than titanium. Titanium is a terrible bearing surface. That's we never use it for, for the ball part of a hip joint. Even if you have a titanium hip part, the ball's chrome cobalt. Um, because titanium is, is, is soft and scratches easily, so it's not a good bearing material. Um, the chrome cobalt metal on metal joints shed a lot of chrome cobalt ions. And that's probably, I mean, I don't know what you're, you're referring to there, Lauren, but there are people that can get high levels of cobalt and high levels of chrome that can cause local problems like tissue resorption and bone resorption and failure of their implants. Um, cobalt, some people get into cobalt poisoning where they get neurologic issues and, and, and other si cobalt side effects. So that's rare in implants outside of metal on metal hip replacements. Um, and once we stop doing those, we're not seeing that problem as much there's a small percentage of people that are getting chrome, especially uh, chromium ion issues relating to corrosion at tapers, um, where the ball and the sock, or the ball and the stem, everything we use now, you know, in, in modern replacement as far as hips go are modular, which is nice because it allows us a lot of variability. We can change the length of your leg by using a different ball and how far that ball is drilled that 
get three, four millimeters here. And it's really nice. It's like Tinker Toys, but it also means that they're modular and they have an interface where they come together. And there's been some issues with corrosion and um, galvanic corrosion and in, in between dissimilar metals at that taper. And so some people can get uh, chromium, specifically chromium uh, issues, occasionally cobalt from that, but that's really not nearly as common as the, um, as the uh, metal on metal implants. Does that help? Yeah. Oh yeah, you had, you had two questions, <laughs> sorry. Um, there's no exercise that stops arthritis. Once it starts, it's, I mean, you can do things to probably I mean, make it less likely that you, you know, you're gonna advance it quickly by doing more low impact exercise. So swimming, biking, those kind of things are always your best. Your weight's off the joint. It's going to hurt your joint less if you have an arthritic joint. It's going to put less wear and tear on it. Um, walking is an in-betweener. It's probably better than jumping and running and those kind of things. So any low impact exercise, if you have an arthritic joint is good. It's good because it keeps the range of motion of your joint. It keeps your strength up and all of those are positive effects for your joint. But there's no exercise that will forestall arthritis from happening or, or reverse it but it's good to get exercise, even if you have an arthritic joint in a low impact fashion to make your joint as mobile and supportive as far as strength as, as you can. No. Exercise does not Hop. develop cartilage. <laughs> uh, that's Dr. A, Hop, that's we, a misnomer you'll find in the exercise community. We have a question yep. that came into the chat and that is, is the level of pain the best determinant as to when to have knee replacement surgery or are there other factors to consider? Level of pain is definitely one of the main indicators. Um, I usually tell patients it's quality of life as a whole. When your quality of life is affected by your pain, your stiffness, your inability to do activities that you normally would need or want to do, that's when joint replacement becomes kind of reality if you're not responding to the non-operative things that we can do. Um, and, qual and pain is a big quality of life factor, obviously. And pain, pain is probably the most, the, is the number one symptom that we're looking at improving with joint replacement, although we will improve range of motion, we'll improve strength and all those things too. Pain is the number one thing we, get, we improve. So it is a, a pretty big driver of when you decide to do a joint replacement. Thank you. There's one more. Um, do you get involved in sports knee injuries that involve ligament damage, but not replacement of the joint? I'm sorry. Ligament damage. Do you deal with that? Do I personally? Sports injuries versus just. Joint um, I, I used to, I really don't do much sports stuff anymore. I kind of evolved my practice into almost all joint replacement. Um, I, I do a fair amount of arthroscopy for meniscus issues and that kind of thing still, but um, I have a partner who is specialized in ligament reconstruction for sports problems. So he does all of those things uh, for me now that I, I, I used to do, but that's a common problem, you know, and there are, that's the biggest thing. If you have a knee problem, the best thing is to get it evaluated and find out what it is because not everybody needs a joint replacement for sure. Uh, there's a lot of knee problems that we can treat non-operatively and there's ones we can treat with arthroscopy and, 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 and do lesser procedures and get good results without needing to go through a big joint replacement. So uh, does it make a difference in the material that the joint is made from as far as susceptibility to rejection or infection of the material? Okay. With respect to infection, no. I mean, infection is kind of an independent variable from implant type and things, you know, infection, it probably relates more to host factors like other medical problems like diabetes or immune compromise or other reasons. Um, infection is, is one of those things that it's, it's the thing we worry about the most as surgeons going into surgery. Uh, although it's one of our rare complications, you know, in joint replacement right now, my practice, the, the rate of infection after a hip or knee replacement is 0.2%. But we can't make it zero. And I always have that discussion every time we talk about surgery, you know, I will do everything we can to avoid infection for you, but 0.2% of the time it's going to happen. And I, I'm not able to avoid that. And, and, and it does, you know, but if you get somebody comes that has diabetes, they're on steroids, 
their risk is probably two to 3%. So there are host factors are the biggest thing. And your other question was rejection. I assume you kind of mean rejection, meaning your body is allergic to it or for some reason doesn't accept, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's when I talked about Dr. Charnley deciding to implant all those pieces of stuff into his thighs just to see what, you know, what the body would accept. Um, we have people like him to help thank some, but the, we've gotten to the point where most of our materials are very well accepted by the body, except for a small subset of patients that do seem to have typically metal allergies. The, plastic, the, the plastics that we use now are, seem to be very well tolerated. It's the, it's the small percentage of people that have allergies and typically the most common allergy is nickel. Occasionally we see allergies to chrome, cobalt, um, but nickel is the number one. Titanium seems to be really exceedingly, exceedingly rare to have any metal allergy to. And even that and the rate of allergy or rejection to the implants is super low. It's really, really low. And we can do testing for that ahead of, ahead of time if, if patients are concerned. And we also have alternative implants. So if I get somebody that is nickel, nickel allergic, I will use an all titanium knee replacement um, to avoid nickel. It's not the ideal bearing surface, but for them, I don't want them rejecting their implant. They'll do fine with a titanium implant. There are ceramic, all ceramic implants that are being done in especially Asia, but they're not FDA approved and we can't get them here. So those are probably the most ideal to avoid a metal allergy if you have one, but they're just not available in the United States. Could you talk about the injections, the cortisone injections? Mm -hmm. Well, we can talk about injections as a whole. <laughs> the, the, yeah, yeah, injections are an option for, for conservative management of arthritis. And that's the thing about, you know, especially management of arthritis ranges from medications to control inflammation, um, like ibuprofen, Aleve, all the different prescription anti-inflammatories, turmeric and different um, herbal supplements that can, can control inflammation as well. And I have lots, excuse me, lots of patients that feel turmeric is very helpful. Um, then you get into things like injections and injections can vary from cortisone, which is kind of our old historic standby to hyaluronic acid injections, which are one of the molecules that makes up normal cartilage that lubricates the knee, stem cell injections, and then platelet rich plasma injections are another type of injection. Cortisone is just a steroid that decreases inflammation in the joint. It does a nice job at that. Uh, it has a role. Um, and especially in patients that you know aren't ready for surgery, that don't want surgery, um, there is some concern over long-term use of cortisone uh, with respect to effects on the local tissues, or if you get them repeatedly, especially multiple locations, they can cause pituitary adrenal insufficiencies, which because they're you're essentially shutting down your own body's cortisol production. So that's something to be aware of and and, and careful of. Um, the hyaluronic acid injections are, are helpful for a lot of patients. We're not finding that they're in a broad numbers better than cortisone. And actually a lot of the insurance companies because of that aren't paying for those currently, um, but they're an option. And, uh, and, and the nice thing is they're not a steroid. Um, so, um, how well they work depends on the level of your arthritis. You come in with bone on bone arthritis, they're probably not going to do too well. Um, PRP injections are, is just a preparation of plasma. We draw the blood off the patient, they get spun down and we take the serum that has the platelet layer in that serum. And it can be used for um, treatment of arthritis. The results have been kind of mixed. Uh, it's kind of one of those, it, if you wanna do it, we can. It's not covered by insurance most of the time. Um, I had some patients that have had good results, others that have not. It's probably had its best use in treatment of things like tennis elbow and tendonitis issues more than arthritis. And then stem cells, which we, we kind of talked about. I don't have a whole lot of to say about stem cells other than that it's not ready for prime time. But there's plenty of people that'll take your $16,000 per shot to do it. Uh, all I can say is from my own personal experience with two hips and a shoulder, out of your office is that in every case I said, why didn't I do this years ago? <laughs> because suddenly I'm pain free. And yeah, we hear that a lot. Remain so, so we hear that a lot. You know, and, and the thing about, about it is 
you have to be in the right mental headspace and ready, you know, to, to say, I'm going to take on it's as you know, Bill, it's not a, it's not a simple thing. You, you got to go through a lot of therapy and recovery and you have to be mentally, socially ready. You have to have help and support. And, and that's different for everybody is when you, when you feel ready, but we do hear a lot. I wish I would have done it sooner. Do you have a question? Second. <laughs> Second in there. I have a question. Yeah. Would you comment on the in ter terms of total knee replacement? Uh, versus partial knee replacement, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is appropriate and for whom? Sure. Um, we didn't really get into that. Uh, let's go back. Can we see the... So I didn't, I, unfortunately, I didn't put a slide in here for partial versus total knee replacement. And the, the idea is replacing only one side of the knee joint versus both sides of the knee joint. Uh, that was. So, um, oh, there it is. Okay. Um, in this situation, this is a total knee replacement. We're replacing the inside and the outside of the knee joint on both sides. If you can imagine just having an implant that would replace the inside part there on both sides or the outside part. Um, Partial knee replacements are a really good option for a small subset of patients. You have to have very isolated arthritis to the side of the knee that you want to replace. Replacement, partial knee replacements have had a pretty poor track record on the outer side of the knee, so I don't do those at all. I will do them on the inside part of the knee if I have someone that has completely you know, isolated arthritis to the inside part of the knee, no signs of arthritis in the rest of the knee on their x-ray and their pain is always right there. Um, because the one concern is you can do a partial knee replacement and then develop arthritis in the rest of the knee down the road. And that's the bugaboo with that is if you pick somebody that, oh, it's mostly the inside, the outside doesn't look bad, but there's a little bit there, four or five years later, they may be coming back saying, well, we got to redo the whole thing into a total knee replacement. And that was probably the better operation in the first place. So when you look at numbers, it's probably 10 to 15% of people with our knee arthritis are good, good candidates for partials or maybe even less. So, so it's a decision to make with your surgeon, you know, do you feel like that's an option and do they feel like it's, it's possible? It's, kind, it's nice because it's a little bit faster recovery, but it's still a big surgery, you know, so. Mm -hmm. We've got a daughter 50 years old who's going to have knee replacement. What would be typical time to get healthy in that knee? Yeah. From the range. Typically, you're up and walking on the day of surgery, moving right away. Um, may or may not stay in the hospital overnight. Um, we're doing you know, some of the younger patients and as outpatients now going home the same day. Um, you're walking on the, the knee right away, using a walker or crutches for a week or two, transitioning to a cane for two to three weeks. You know, usually by three to four weeks, we're walking without any support. And I would say by four to six weeks, she'll feel like she's hopefully back to her routine round the house life pretty normally. And then building up into outside activities from there. Usually by eight weeks, I tell people they can do whatever they feel comfortable doing. Just as an example, I tell people they can golf at eight weeks. They can start to do those kind of things. And everything's progressive. But when you want to say her knee is going to be as good as it's going to be, it'll be a year. The subtle things that change over that first year before she's going to say, yeah, I'm, a, I'm as best as I'm going to be. And you guys maybe can speak to that. I mean, yeah, the big improvement's really quick. But the subtle things when you say, yeah, I'm, I don't even think about this. Yeah, no, no. But there, there are things that improve over the whole first year. But by six to eight weeks, should be very functional. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hope that was helpful or an inter and interesting. Maybe. Thank you, John. It was wonderful. My pleasure. It's good to see you guys. Familiar faces, too. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us on Zoom. Have a good day.